turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to begin a long, long series on the book of Acts. Now, we're going to be going through the book of Acts a chapter a week. And uh, the reason we're doing this is we're talking about the kingdom of God. We're talking about how the gospel spread throughout the known world. Okay? So because Jesus died, because he rose, because the Holy Spirit was poured out, because the gospel was preached, because the Spirit of God is at work in the world through the gospel being preached, we're going to actually get into it. And hopefully, this is, this is the hope, hopefully it gets into us. That's the point. You know, and so we're going to read this. We're going to go over it. We're going to talk about it. Hopefully, we're going to learn from it. Hopefully, we can avoid some of their mistakes. Hopefully, we can see where they went right. And hopefully, we can really begin to move forward because this is a, I don't know if you know this, but this is a gospel centered church. This is not an entertainment church, this is not a feelings church. This is not a place for you to come to feel better about yourself. This is, this is not therapy, by the way. Uh, you know, the church should be for therapy. It should be the best place for therapy because you can actually change and never be the same. But this is a gospel-centered, Christ-centered, let the fire of God get in your life, get on you type of place and go to the nations and do something with your life and reach out to people around you, whether it's across the street or across the world. There's people who are hurting all over and we want to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. So anyway, Acts was written by Luke, and Luke is a Greek doctor, and Acts is written, this is a very interesting thing, but it's written to this person who nobody knows who this person is, and they cannot find anything about this person, but his name is Theophilus, and Theophilus means friend of God. So this book is written to the friend of God. So let me explain to you if you're a friend of God or not. You can sing, I am a friend of God, and still not be a friend of God. A friend of God is not someone who is perfect, but a friend of God is someone who has set their heart on obedience to Jesus. It doesn't mean we don't fall. It doesn't mean we don't stumble. But it means the motive of your heart is that when Jesus speaks, you say yes and amen. Not, you, you know, you tell him why you can or why you won't or what he's got to do so that you'll do anything or something for him one day. But that when he speaks, there's a yes in us that says, yes, I, you are the one and only. You're not one of many. You are the one and the only. You're the only true and living God. And because you are, I'm going to obey you and I'm going to set my heart on obeying you. And so this is written to the friend of God. Now, Acts takes place over about a 30-year time period. So one of the misconceptions that we have, especially Pentecostals, which we have a lot of misconceptions, especially about the Bible, but one of the, one of the misconceptions that we have when we read the book of Acts is, if you read the book of Acts, especially in a more modern translation, you'll notice that Acts is a page-turner. And what I say by that is there's supernatural things happening, there's angels, there's prison, there's jail, there's death, there's miracles. And so if you actually just read it, it's like, man, this would make a great movie. And so it's kind of like a page turner and there's a lot of things going on. And one of the things that we uh, can, can fail to understand is that within Acts being a page turner, there's actually 30 years of page turning in this process. So you see a miracle here, a miracle there, and a miracle here, and you go, oh my God, these people are amazing. All they had is miracles. No, they had a lot more trouble than they had miracles. And so you have to realize that this is not just, but this is 30 years. So from Acts 1 to Acts 28 is about a 30 year time period. So just keep that in mind because what you do is you read miracle, 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 prison, jail, death, miracle, martyr, miracle, miracle, and you think it's just this big of miracles. And that's not actually what happened. Actually, there was a lot of struggle and a lot of uh, things that took place within the context of miracle, miracle, miracle. And so it's not all just miracles. It is miracles. Miracles are not just for yesterday, but they're for today. And they're Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so miracles is not a thing of the past. But it's important to remember that this is a 30-year time frame in which this is happening. Now, Luke is also... Um, the writer of Luke, obviously, but Luke and Acts are actually like more like one book with two sections. The reason they're split up is because in the ancient times people would write on a scroll, and so what Luke did is he filled up one scroll, 
Luke, and he filled up another scroll, Acts. And that's why if you look at them, they're very similar in length because he probably used the whole scroll to write the story that he was trying to tell. And we're going to get into that story in a minute. In Acts 1, you're going to see that he, he explains uh, what he's trying to say. Now, that's very important because what happens when you're trying to communicate, some people are trying to communicate and they don't even know what they're trying to say. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever listened? Have you ever been the person who's talking and you, you probably haven't given much thought to what you're saying and so as soon as you start talking, everyone else starts to realize you haven't gave much thought to what you're saying and so you don't even know what you're saying. But the good news is that this guy has thought about and has heard about what he wants to say. So he's not writing and, 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 you know, he's not, this is not, he's not speaking and writing just as it happens, but he's actually cognizant of what he's trying to say. It's very important. If you want to be a good communicator, you have to know what you're trying to say. You have to know, who, what am I trying to say? Who am I saying it to? And how do I say it? And when do I say it? These are important parts of communication. And if you want to be married or stay married, that's a, that's a really important thing. Now, verse 1 of Acts. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach. So, the Gospel of Luke is what he's referring to. And the Gospel of Luke is what Jesus began to do and teach. Okay, watch. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You're going to find out that in just a few moments, the day after 40 days of dealing with a resurrected Jesus still did not understand the message that Jesus was preaching or what Jesus was teaching or the whole purpose of why he died and why he rose. And one of the things is, this is the good news for us, if you are a little slow to get it, if you are really not understanding, like if you read the Bible and sometimes you feel a little frustrated, you feel like I'm not really getting, you know, let me just say, Historically speaking, you're in pretty good company because these guys walk with Jesus for three years, day and night, spent 40 days eating with the man who was raised from the dead, who was talking to them about one thing and one thing only, and they still didn't get it. So if you feel that you're a little, that's okay. You are in good company. We are in good company. Watch this. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they would not depart from Jerusalem, but that they would wait for the promise of the Father. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge us all with something right now. The world, the world that we live in, it says that you've got to work for the promise. But in the kingdom, there are certain things that you can never work for, but you only have to wait for them. And then there's certain things in real life that you can wait until you turn blue, but if you don't work for it, you're not going to get it. So you cannot not hear what I'm saying. What I'm not saying is just wait and be passive uh, and, and, and be complacent. Because sometimes people say, I'm waiting, and what they're really doing is they're lazy and they're complacent. And they say, I'm waiting on the Lord, but they're not waiting on the Lord. They're lazy, they have no vision. And they're not being faithful, putting their hand to do what they know to do. That's not what I'm saying. See, waiting in this in this. Uh, context was an expression of obedience and it was an expression of faithfulness not laziness in our culture folks are saying church, especially church folks I'm waiting on the Lord no you're not doing anything I'm waiting till the Lord tells me well what if an audible voice from heaven never tells you you better do what you know to do that he's already revealed to you right. some people say I don't go on a mission trip unless God tells me then you may never go on a missions trip. Paul went until, unless God said no. Now we have people who won't go unless they hear something. So I, I, I'm trying to bring to you a balanced approach on this idea of waiting because waiting for them was active participation and it was part of how they were positioning themselves to receive what God had for them. So they could not work for it. They did not earn it. They did not deserve it, but they had to wait for it 
so that they could receive it. It was kind of like God saying, I'm going to show up next week at 3 o'clock, but if you're not there, you're going to miss it. So just go there and just wait. And sometimes, especially for these type of guys, these are very type A, most of these guys. These are not people who just sit there, you know, and, and just wait and, and watch Netflix. These are, these are people who were active. I mean, they spilled their life and their blood for the cause of Christ. These are not passive people. And so waiting for people like that is not easy. Now, I don't know about you. Waiting is, for some of you, maybe you're patient and you're so nice and good. But waiting is not easy for me. For some of us, we're, we are prone to action, not wait. So for some people, waiting is worse than working. <laughs> for people who like to do stuff, you know, it's not easy, you know. So, so anyway, wait for the promise of the Father. Now we're going we're gonna to talk, why does he call him the promise of the Father? We're going we're gonna to get into that, but let's continue. Wait, this is Jesus, for the promise of the Father. Which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In other words, God is going to show up. Wait for him. Now, we're going to explain, I'm going to, the scriptures are going to teach us what kind of uh, power and what kind of person that they're waiting for. And I, I want to get into that because they're not just waiting for a promise. They're just not wait, just waiting for their blessing or for their breakthrough. They're waiting for a person. For John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus is speaking very confidently about what's about to happen, and he knows about what to happen. Verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time, Kronos, restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times and seasons for which the Father has put in his own authority. Watch this. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you should be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, the place they wanted to avoid. God wants to use you in the very place that you want to avoid. God wants to use you with the very people that you don't like. And to the ends of the earth. They want to talk about Israel. He wants to talk about Samaria. I don't like those people. Good. God wants to use you with them too. God likes them. And to the ends of the earth. Now, here's the situation. Jesus gave commandments through the Holy Spirit, not suggestions. That, that's, that's very important. Sometimes when Jesus talks to us, we feel as if it's a nice suggestion. You don't understand. We're going to be held accountable for what he told us to do. Not did you feel like it, did you, I mean, did you get a vibe about it? This is not vibe checking. This is, he speaks, you, we do it. I mean, that, that's pretty clear what the Bible speaks. So for 40 days, he speaks to them about the kingdom of God. They still don't get it. You know how I know they don't get it? Because they're still asking the wrong question. They're thinking geopolitical. When are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel. They still don't get the kingdom. They are thinking temporal. He is thinking transcendent. They are still thinking like victims. He is thinking like a conqueror. They are thinking Jerusalem, the little temple, our little thing, our little religious thing. Jesus is thinking all of heaven and all of earth. They are thinking, you know, we're going to build the temple and, you know, God will, God will live in this little nice box and we'll visit him on the weekends. It'll be like weekend visitation. God is saying, no, 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 excuse me. I want to move in with you. The promise is not a place. The promise is not land. The promise is not you just being blessed and happy. The promise is a person, and the promise is that God, the Holy Spirit, wants to take residence inside of you. He doesn't want you to just go to the temple. He wants to make you the temple. He doesn't just want you to pray. He wants to make you a prayer meeting. 
He, he is looking to move in and to transform us and to make us like Christ so that we can represent Christ in this world. And so they say, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They are thinking again, geopolitical. They're under Roman occupation. They've had a hard life. It's not easy. They feel like they want to be vindicated. They feel like they want to be free. And Jesus is saying, I I'm going to do that, but I want to do it deep within. I don't want to fix your circumstances. I want to fix the very reason why you are in those circumstances. Jesus is always looking to go deeper. We're always looking to like fix the problem. Jesus goes, I want to touch the very root of the problem. I want to uproot the root of the pro uproot the problem and I want to change that soil so that if a, a bad seed is planted again, you, you don't produce bad fruit again. Because there's certain soil that allows the wrong things to grow in it. And he wants to go deep to the root and change the soil. Till the soil and really bring, you know, some real change. It is not for you to know the times, which is the word chronos, which is watch time. It's not for you to know the times and seasons. The word seasons there in Greek is the kairos. It is the, the, the divine when God, in a sense, visits time and space. It is a divine moment in time where God, where by faith we seize an opportunity. It's a God moment. It's when heaven invades earth. It's when the eternal breaks into now. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has in his own authority. So if I could draw like a little circle, within the circle would be watch time, and Kairos time. And the Father brokers time through His own authority. And that authority He gives to us. You have to take authority over your time. If you don't take authority over your time, your time will take authority over you. I'm going to continue. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses. Now, this is like, if you, if you look carefully in Matthew 10 and Luke 9 and 10, these guys already moved in miracle power. They already cast out demons. They already healed the sick. I mean, this is the Bible. You can look at it. So what kind of power is he talking about? He says, I will give you power to be my witnesses. I will give you power to not love your life even unto death. The word witness is the word martyr. You cannot love God wholeheartedly and you cannot serve God wholeheartedly if you are afraid. If you're afraid, I would encourage you not to be a Marine. If you're afraid, I would say probably don't need to be a missionary. You have to deal with fear. If you like to control every little thing, come with me on a trip. Come. Because it will destroy your idea of control. Of you thinking that you're in control. Of the facade of you being in control. It'll... it'll Six minutes in Haiti, that, that'll, that'll, you'll get, it'll be contested. Before you leave the airport, you'll realize I'm not in control. So the, the point here, right, is that God wants to do something in our life that's more powerful than the fear of death. The fear of death is what controls people. Most people are afraid to die. I've heard people say, I'm afraid to die. I've heard many times people say, I'm afraid to die because they don't have an assurance of salvation. I've heard Christians say that because you know many Christians, I hate to say this, they are not really sure of their salvation. You know why? They don't really know Jesus. Salvation is a person, not an idea. It's not an insurance policy. So many people are unsure of death because they don't really have a relationship with life. Jesus is life. So Jesus is saying, fellas, listen, 
You guys already moved in miracle power. You've already cast out demons. But the problem is that you, you still love your life. Peter gets asked, hey, you know Jesus? He starts cursing at a young girl. I don't know him. The scene before, you're cutting a guy's ear off for him. Half an hour later, you know, bipolar Peter, he doesn't know Jesus and he's cursing at a young girl. So it's like, well, wait a minute. Are you, you didn't know Jesus. You don't know Jesus. You cut an ear off for Jesus. Now you're cursing at a little girl telling her you don't know Jesus. You're like, then the Holy Spirit comes in him, comes upon him, and Peter becomes unshakable. Peter was not strong in his own strength. Peter was strong in the Lord. When they whip and beat Peter, you're going to see, we're going to get into it. Peter says, I am not going to stop talking about Jesus. The same Peter that, you know, a few days, <laughs> like 50, 60, you know, a little bit before this, I don't even know Jesus. Jesus who? You left your business, your wife, your family, and your kids, and you walked with this guy for three years, cut an ear off for him, and now you don't know Jesus. That's how unstable we are in our own strength, all over the place. And if you think, I have a strong will, I'm different, no, you're not. You need Jesus, trust me. You don't believe me? You don't have to. Your spirit leaves your body. You'll be real aware that you need Jesus. Trust me. People go, I don't believe that. Okay. He'll still judge you on the last day. You don't have to believe. Now, th th this, is, this is something here. It is not for you to know. In other words, don't worry about what I'm doing with the nation. Don't worry about that. Worry about what I'm doing in you. You, you know, one of the ways we're preoccupied, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say this, I hope this doesn't offend anyone. You know, one of the ways we're, we get preoccupied and we miss what God is doing in our life, we're so focused on what's not happening or what's happening in the world around us that we're not even focused on what's happening in the world within us. Do you know that when someone, all they want to talk about is the news or this or that, that's, that's, you know what that is? That's a defense mechanism that they don't want to deal with the real issues in their own life. They want to talk about some other thing and some other problem. But you shall receive power. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and he will make you a witness. A martyr. That's what it means. You're going to have power not to love your life. You cannot be effective in the kingdom of God if you're afraid. You cannot serve God or love God wholeheartedly if fear resides within you. Do you understand? I'm not talking about if you go to the edge of the mountain and your heart starts beating. That's your body telling yourself, you keep walking, we're going to be done forever. I'm not talking about being stupid or being crazy or reckless. I'm not talking about being reckless, but I am talking about boldness. I am talking about we have a mission. We're on a mission. A real mission. I have a friend, he's in Jordan right now. He's going to Iraq right now. He's married, he has a nice little life, but he's on a mission. Mission is, is not easy. Mission sometimes is not safe. Verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will also come in like manner. Here is the fulfillment of Daniel 7, 13. I, um, many times when, when, you, when you hear that he's going to be co coming on the clouds, many times people think that's always speaking about his, his coming, his, his return. But you'll see in Daniel 7 that actually that's about his ascension. Anyway, I'm going to be careful. So, verse 12, And when they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey, and when they had entered, they went up into an upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, 
the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued in one accord, watch this, in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with Jesus' brothers. Because the Blessed Virgin is no longer a virgin. And so Jesus has, you know, brothers that came from Mary, from Joseph to Mary. So the Blessed Virgin is no longer a Blessed Virgin. And now Jesus' brothers are a part of this group. And let me explain to you something about half-brothers and brothers. Sometimes they don't believe in you until they have to. Sometimes people do not believe in you until they have to. See, they did not believe in Jesus before the resurrection. But here's what fruit does. Fruit is convincing. You cannot argue with fruit. People say, oh, I don't believe you. No offense, I don't care. <laughs> I was lost in sin and I was dead and now I'm alive. I was blind and now I see. I was sick and now I'm well. So it's like you, don't ar you cannot argue and debate a testimony. You don't have to believe. It's my testimony. <laughs> you know, like, so, so what's interesting here <laughs> is they all continued uh, in one accord in prayer and supplications. Do you know what we do? <laughs> we do supplications and then prayer. You know what supplication is? What I want. We got a long list of supplications, short prayers. It's the other way around. It's prayer and supplication. <laughs> prayer is prayer is not uh, you know getting the Lord to do my will and my kingdom. Prayer is about His kingdom and His will, which is a little different because I understand how that works. Trust me. My supplication list is probably longer than all yours. So the reality is that they continued with prayer and with supplication. And so the prayer gives you, watch this, prayer gives you the power to wait for the promise. Prayer, a life of prayer, I'm telling you, and I, I'm, I'm being honest, as honest as I can, a life of prayer will sustain you in the hardest times. Someone who does not have a, a, a vibrant prayer life, when they go through any type of hard times, will become immediately discouraged, immediately depressed, immediately burnt out because they don't have a vibrant prayer life. Because what happens is if I don't have somewhere to take my pain, I'm going to take my pain to the wrong place. If I don't have somewhere to take my pain and get the right perspective, then I'm going to be walking around in, in, in Delusionville and I'm going to be living from my pain and from the perspective that my pain has given me because of my choices or the choices of some other crazy person that I've chosen to associate with or marry. So now, I don't know if you're with me, now they continued in one accord in prayer and in supplication. Prayer is making a demand on what God has already paid for. Supplication is you saying, hey Lord, help a brother out. Prayer is saying, God, you promised it. God, you paid for it. God, you said that it was mine. You paid with your life, with your blood. By your stripes I am healed. You said that you crowned my life with loving kindness and tender mercies. You said that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You said that the angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear him. You said that never have I seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. You said, you, you know, and, and so he made it, he paid, and I, and I put a demand on what he's paid for. There's nothing wrong with it. That's what prayer is. Supplication is not that. Supplication is, hey, listen, 
I got some needs. Say, Lord, I need you to help me. I need you to, you know, work these things in my favor. And let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with that. But just keep it this way. Prayer and supplication, not supplication and prayer. You see what I'm saying? Because the order there matters. Paul talks about coming before God with thanksgiving, prayers and supplications. So there is an order. It's not, just, it's not just what I want. It's what he wants and then what I want. That, that's, the, that's the correct order. That's how mature sons and daughters uh, flow. Okay, so they're continuing with one accord, and now the women are there as well. Now, Luke is writing this because in the ancient world, the women were not really relevant to the story, but to the gospel, they're relevant. Because Paul, I mean, because Luke rather is telling a real story. He is not trying to convince you about something, he's just telling you what happened. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, all together the number and names of about 120, and said, Men and brethren, the scripture needs to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails, or his intestines, gushed out, those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akeldama, which is a field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his, desolate pla let his place be desolate, and let no one live in it. And let another take his office. 21. Therefore, of these men... Who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness for us of his resurrection. You, you see the message? The message is the resurrection. The resurrection is what gives birth to the kingdom. As sure as you are of the resurrection, as sure as you are of the kingdom. So you have to realize that Peter, Jesus opened the scriptures to them. The scriptures say that in Luke, that Jesus opened the scriptures concerning himself. So that means that Peter now uh, is able to see the scriptures from the Spirit's perspective. He's able to see what God is saying and from that what God wants to do. When we know what God has said, we know what God wants to do. And it's the role of leadership to discern through the scriptures by the Spirit what God wants to do. That's, that's our job. If you're leading, then you better know what God wants to do. If you're leading a house, you're leading a business, you're leading a family, you're leading a church, you better know. <laughs> that's your job. If you don't know, then you better figure it out. My suggestion is get on your face and pray and humble yourself. And then you'll figure it out that way. So... Peter stands up, they're in one accord, they're praying, they're making their supplications, they're, they're agreeing with God's will, they're mentioning their needs, they're, you know, and so they're praying, they're together, and in the place of prayer, the next initiative comes forth. This is why I say, where there's intercession, the next initiative comes through intercession. So they're praying, and from a place of prayer, Peter understands that something must happen. He discerns that the scriptures were written. It's speaking of Judas. And now his position needs to be occupied. This is essential because if this doesn't happen, this needs to happen. And he discerns by the spirit, according to the scriptures, what must take place. So Peter stands up and he gives his spiel. And what's fascinating to me, this is a very, very simple yet fascinating reality. Peter is not like, listen, we need to get someone who really looks good on camera. He needs to be a great communicator. He needs to be really good at social media. Like he looks, he has to look great in skinny jeans. No, no, no. Peter doesn't say that. Peter says, no, no, no. There's one requirement. He has to be with us from the beginning to the end. He has to be consistent. He has to be someone who has staying power. One requirement. Not perfect. Not, you know, 
gifted, not the greatest speaker. He has to be consistent. Someone who from the beginning discerned that, hey, God is doing something and I'm going to stick to what God is doing and I'm going to follow that thing through and I'm going to follow that thing out and I'm not going to give up and I'm not going to go home and I'm not going to quit. I'm going to stay. We live in a world where everyone runs and if you can stay, just because you can stay, you have power. Power to stay. You know, we, you, this is talking about power to go. Yeah, well, there's also power to stay because it's easy to run. We live in a generation of runners. You offended me? I'm running. It's not favorable to me? I'm running. You have to know what's worth staying for. I'm not saying stay in a dumb job or, 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 or stay in abusive situations. But I am saying that if you're going to follow Jesus, stick with it. If you're going to serve Jesus, stick with it. The, the, what, the, Matthias, he goes from... He goes literally from nameless to famous. And nobody knows who he is. He's not even mentioned before this. Nobody even knows who he is. He was just a guy in the crowd. And God says, no, no, no. I'm going to bring you forward. Why? Because you were consistent. Because you were faithful. That's what faithfulness will do. Faithfulness will take you from nameless to famous. People who are consistent. People who stay. People who don't quit. When other folks tap out if you stay you'll be promoted if you stay you'll be blessed if you stay you'll grow if you stay you'll move into a place of significance he goes from no name to a name faithfulness and I'm encouraging you listen if you're gonna follow Jesus for real follow him don't play games this is not a game this is not a hobby this is not, you know, a Sunday morning to feel good. No, no, no. If you're going to follow Jesus, really, like follow Jesus. You, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm encouraging you because if you want God to move you forward and bring you forward and do things in your life and work through you powerfully, and if you want to really change, and if you want to know that you're not who you once were, stick it out. Stick, it out. stick around. That's what I love about old guys. Old guys in the ministry will just look at you. They won't help you. They won't really encourage you. They'll just look at you. Five years later, if you're still there, they'll help you. You know what they're doing? They're seeing if you can stick it out. That's old school. Now we couldn't even wait three weeks. Folks don't get recognized to be out. <laughs> Jesus. Ah, I'm going to behave. All right. And they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who is surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship. We're going to get into that in a minute, too. From which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And when they cast lots, basically rolled dice, the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. They go from 11 to 12. 12 was the number of apostolic government. I don't know if you realize this, but there was 12 tribes of Israel. I don't know if you realize this, but there were 70 elders in Israel. Jesus is reconstituting the nation of Israel around himself. Aha. The true Israel, who was faithful in the wilderness when Israel was not. See, we don't have a covenant with God. God did not make a covenant with Adam, because Adam would fail. God made a covenant with his son Jesus and brought us into that covenant through faith in Jesus. And all the promises that were made to Abraham are yes and amen in Jesus. That's why the scripture calls us children of Abraham. But now the promise is not just land, but the promise is a person. Jesus said that the promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit. Because here's the problem with land. The problem with land is if I move into idolatry, the land gets taken from me. But if I'm the land and I am transformed, then wherever I go, the promise goes. The presence goes and the power goes. And God is not just interested in one nation. He's interested in all people. 
God is not interested in some living in some building somewhere. God is interested in making his people a habitation for himself. God is not interested in you having weekend visitation rights. God is interested in living among and living through his people. So what happens here is Peter discerns by the Spirit what happened concerning Judas. He understands that this position needs to be fulfilled. He understands that this is, needs to happen. He discerns, okay, there's one requirement. Consistency and faithfulness. I, I, don't, I know that this is a very old school thing to say. But if you look at the word diligent or diligence you like go in the King James and you realize it says this about the diligent that the diligent hand maketh rich under my keyboard where I write my books I have taped to that the diligent hand maketh rich that's what I believe the diligent hand it says this about the diligent, that the diligent share bare rule, which means that if you are diligent, you will come into a position of power and authority through diligence. What is diligence? Dil diligence is discipline in motion. Is doing the right thing for the right reasons consistently. That's an old school virtue. We don't talk about that. But let me tell you, diligence, diligence will lead to promotion. If you're diligent, you have to get promoted. L let me give you a person who is diligent, someone who is faithful, Joseph. He gets thrown into a pit, he gets promoted. He gets thrown into prison, he gets promoted. He gets falsely accused and thrown into prison, he gets promoted. He goes to a palace, he gets promoted. In a famine, he gets promoted. That's what faithfulness and diligence will do for you. It will provide you with an opportunity to serve others with what has been entrusted to you. Diligence. But let me tell you, diligence is not feelings. Diligence is not feelings. To, to really walk in diligence, sometimes you've got to turn feeling off. The little voice that talks to you, off. And just do the right thing. And you know what's funny? Guess what? Can I tell you something? Do you know that we do? We know the right thing. We lie to ourselves. But we know deep inside the right thing. We play games with ourselves. But deep inside we know. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't say that. As soon as I say something crazy, which I have, I do say some crazy stuff, immediately I know I should have said that. The other day I had something marinating. I was going to say it. I was going to say it. And I was like, and somehow God stopped me. I was like, yes, because I was going to say something crazy. But now the next level of dealing with that is no longer thinking about it. See, because I thought about it enough that it was like I already said it. And God knew. See, we, we have to... We have to really, if we want to really walk in the blessing of God, we've got to continue in that which God has called us to do. Now, Jesus opened the scriptures to Peter, to the disciples, and it's evident through Peter having direction and through him understanding, okay, we've got to appoint Matthias. And so he did it through the rolling of dice. I mean, that's not that spiritual, by the way. The Spirit will lead you according to the scriptures. I would like to encourage you. My last slide. Where's my last slide? Someone there? No one's there. Erica's there. Watch what it says. Check this out. People who are watching, you can't see this, unfortunately. Lunchtime is coming. You know what that means? That's my last slide. So that's, my, that's, the, that's the warning. It's time for the pizza. So what that means is this. Can I, get, can I keep it simple? When God says wait, wait. I have put my foot in my mouth probably 6,400 times at least. And you could always say something, but once you say something, you cannot take back what you said because you said it. 
And you say, I didn't mean it. No, the problem is you did mean it. <laughs> so sometimes just be slow to speak. When God says, wait, wait. I'm not saying be lazy. I'm not saying be complacent. But God said to these guys, wait for the promise. They were not going to work for it. Believe it or not, they were not going to pray for it. They were not going to earn it. They didn't deserve it. But they waited. And because they waited, they received. And let me just say that in the kingdom, I hate to say this, I wish this wasn't true. I honest to God with all my heart wish this wasn't true. But in the kingdom, there are certain things that only come by waiting. You know what's powerful about waiting? When you wait, you know what you grow? Patience. Guess what happens if you receive the promise but don't have patience? You squander it. Prayer gives us the power to wait. We cannot wait in our own strength. You don't work for the promise, you wait for it. God had a divine appointment with these guys in this upper room, which we're going to get at next week. The promise is a person who is worth waiting for. I think I just grew more patience. The promise is a person worth waiting for. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying, but they are not waiting for their blessing. They are not waiting for their breakthrough. They are not waiting for their miracle. They are not waiting for a check in the mail. They are waiting for God to empower them to do what God commanded them to do. We have to keep this in the context of what is this about? This is about God, the Holy Spirit, coming upon his people, living in his people, transforming his people, changing his people, making his people more like Christ so that they could represent him in the earth. And what does God want to deal with? God wants to deal with the one thing that will stop that from happening, which is fear. Do you know how many people are stopped because of fear? They're afraid to start a business. They're afraid to start a ministry. They're afraid to serve. You know what some people are afraid of in this generation? They're afraid to make a commitment. People say, oh, it's just a piece of paper. Oh, if it's just a piece of paper, why don't you sign it? Fear stops most people from walking by faith into the purpose that God has for them. So what does God want to do? God wants to deal with the root of the issue. God is going to give them power to become witnesses so that fear and the fear of death no longer controls them. Why? Because if the fear of death controls you, you cannot live powerfully. I'm not saying go climb a mountain without a rope. That's stupid. But what I am saying is that if we are afraid to die, we don't know how to live. Show me the person who's not afraid to die. I'll show you someone who can live wholeheartedly. The promise is a person who is worth waiting for. I love this. Faithfulness will take you from nameless to famous. That's what happened with Matthias. Consistent. He showed up. He was never even mentioned before. Faithfulness. I know that this is, unfortunately, you know what? This is like, how do you sell faithfulness? <laughs> it's like, uh, what are you marketing today? Oh, faithfulness. Oh, what, what does that mean? Well, it means being disciplined. It means having diligence. It means living above your feelings. It means showing up when you don't feel like it. It means showing up early. It means staying late. It means being committed. It means, you know, not being ruled by your anger. It means not giving in to lust. It means actually having self-control. It means actually living a victorious life. How much is it? Oh, it'll cost you everything. What's the reward? Oh, it's eternal. It's eternal. You, you know, you, you can go to sleep at night. You'll, you'll have peace at night. You know, you, you won't look in the mirror and secretly hate yourself. <laughs> you know. All right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have given us power that we don't have to be afraid. And so...
We just rebuke a spirit of fear that would try to silence us, that would try to make us compromise with the world around us, that would try to make us just be quiet and sit down and shut up. We reject fear and we reject the fear of man. We reject the fear of death. We reject the spirit of fear. And we say yes to faith, to love, and to hope. And Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would fill us, would give us an understanding of the scriptures, and would show us what you're doing in our day. We want to be aware of what you're doing in our life. I don't want to, we don't want to be preoccupied by the news or a wall or no wall or every other thing that would blind us from what you're trying to say to us. We want to be able to hear from you because that's real news. That's good news. And so today, Father, we embrace the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We embrace that you want to send us out into the world, that you want to give us power, and that you want to show people what you're really like through us. I pray that when people have an encounter with us, that they have an encounter with you. I pray that they would encounter your love, your grace, and your power. I pray that you would fill us with your wisdom. In Jesus' name.